34%. So in other words, we've known for a, for a very long time that there is an achievement gap face to face, but there hasn't been a lot of research to kind of drill in and look at those, the data at a more granular level and understand what happens to that gap in an online environment. And so that's pretty significant. Um, and he refers to this as the online penalty. That's the title of his study. Let's drill in a little bit more to what he discovered here. Um, after this, he identified this, this, um, this online penalty with online classes, he wanted to really kind of dig in and do a qualitative study to try to understand why different uh, groups of individuals um, might um, understand this problem, right? Discover why this issue is occurring. So the first thing he did was um, he interviewed a group of online instructors and administrators at a California community college that uh, was that is a Hispanic serving institution, served about 15,000 students, and asked them why do online classes exacerbate the white Latino achievement gap. Now the results of those um, interviews turned up three data points. There were three themes that surfaced. Uh, motivation, self-directedness, a lack of that, a lack of technology skills, and a lack of literacy. So really pointing at the students. What was very interesting was that he also interviewed Latino online students at the same institution. And he asked them questions about their good and their bad past experience and experiences in their current online class. None of those themes, none of those deficiencies that were cited by, or that surfaced in the interviews from the instructors and administrators evolved. None of them were found. Instead, the themes that came out were the good learning experiences were characterized by strong, respectful instructor relationship, relationships, and there was a real lack of a relationship with their online instructors online. And I remember one quote from the study that I read um, when asked about an instructor relationship online. One student quote said, what relationship? <laughs> So that says something. Um, and I think what I take away from that study is that the lens that we use to look at a problem really informs the way we understand it. And I think as faculty, as administrators, as anyone within an institution, I think sometimes we have particular conversations that we get stuck in and we forget to shift. We forget to look at the same problem through a different lens, like through a sociocultural lens, um, like Cop did with his study. And one of the things that informs that, um, that understanding is uh, looking at Latino culture, educacion, the concept of education is very much grounded in relationships. So we really need to remember that. Uh, I want to touch on uh, quickly here now that we're, we're moving on to more practical kind of um, ideas about what we can do to uh, really strengthen, improve this problem. At CSU Channel Islands, um, there is a grant-based program called, called ALAS that has been uh, in motion for about two years now. And I know that some of you at Moore Park and within um, your district may actually be participating in some of these ALAS programs. This is one program that we have that strengthens two-year to four-year curricular pathways. So really tries to get students at an early point who have those students who have that goal of trans of getting a four-year degree to understand. Um, you know, this, this pathway towards a degree and the role that the two-year and the four-year college plays in it, but also how their curriculum connects between the two. And the objective of all us is to increase the transfer rates, transfer readiness, and completion of a four-year degree for all transfer students, particularly the historically underserved students. And one uh, new component of ALAS that is just getting started this semester, which is really pretty cool, um, is focused on improving the regional transfer success. So we have uh, programs on campus at CI that, that embed support and, uh, for our current students who have transferred. But what IPATH is doing is building a bridge out between CI and Santa Barbara City College um, and connecting with students who apply to be part of the program and providing them special services. Um, some of the program benefits are listed below. And I had the, the privilege really of um, meeting with this, the, the peer mentors um, who, by the way, are transfer students themselves. And they're going to be facilitating online 
communities and online learning experiences for the students at Santa Barbara City College. And I was able to uh, work with them last semester and do some training um, around what online learning, what high quality online learning looks like. So it's really exciting to see our transfer students actually stepping into this, um, this process of supporting uh, students at local transfer institutions, but also embracing online learning and community building as one of these high impact processes. So if I take a look at this concept of humanizing um, online learning, it plays a really big role about what we do at CSU Channel Islands. And it's really one of the, the fundamental reasons why I love working there so much. We put a really big emphasis on supporting faculty, but from the very beginning, the focus is, you know, not just on, okay, blended learning or online learning. The focus is on how to integrate technology in a meaningful way to support humanized and connected learning. And those are the guiding principles that we use in the work that we do to support faculty to provide professional development. So we really get our faculty right off the bat to start thinking about, you know, this is a very creative process. What is it that you're going to make? You have some choices here. Um, what do you want that experience to be like? Not so much a product, right, but the experience, okay? So, you know, if you think about when you're cooking, yes, you're making a, a thing, you're making a, 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 you know, a product, but it's that experience that you want those who eat the food to have. Um, that's what you're thinking about as you're making it, right? You really want it to be good. And staying on this theme of food, I think it's kind of helpful to think about flavors when we look at what's going on with online learning, because um, as all of you in the room know, maybe be, as your own experience taking an online class, or maybe through the journey of teaching online, which is how I think I started off, um, you know, online learning can, the experience can be a lot like going through a drive through right? You've got a a hunger to fill, right? You have a goal to fill. So you can go into a drive through line, you know, or into an online class and um, get what you need quickly and be done with it. Okay. And that's one flavor of online learning. But the other flavor um, looks and um, it feels more like this. Online learning can also be very rich in community. It can be grounded in relationships between students and between instructor and students. It can be more like staying and having a long, meaningful conversation around a meal where you also get fed, right? But you walk away with a much different experience. There's a host. There are individuals that, are, that come together at this table. And this is the type of learning that um, I would refer to as humanized. This is the type of learning that we aim to cultivate at Channel Islands and uh, what we're talking about here today. So the way that we do it at CI, um, or the way that we're, we're inspiring faculty to engage with this humanized type of learning, we have a three um, course program that's called our Online Teaching Preparation Program. And this is a program that I've designed and I facilitate, and it starts with a two-week class called Humanizing Online Learning. And then it goes into some of the more fundamental kind of traditional experiences when you know you're learning to build a, an online class um, the topic of backward course design is what's covered in in the second course how to design your online course alignment of activities uh, with objectives and um, how to integrate active learning into an online class so all of that is included within the three courses but what we're finding is that starting with this topic of humanizing you know not only is that aligned with our principles our goals, our strategic vision of what learning is at CI, um, regardless of how it takes place, but it's also starting to impact faculty perceptions of online. Um, I have to say that I don't think that the MOOC craze has done much good for online learning in this type of um, you know, connected fashion that we're focusing on here, and that I know what is so important to community colleges as well with small class sizes. Um, so that's been really interesting to see some of the feedback from the faculty who have gone through the program who say that this, the humanizing class has been very eye-opening for them. 
So what is it that we, um, that we focus on in that class? Well, the curriculum, excuse me, gotta take a drink of water. The curriculum in our humanizing online learning <clears throat> class really focuses on the, what I refer to as the two ingredients of humanized online learning. And the first is instructor presence. And going back to that study about um, that COP did, the role, it, and I want to talk directly to those of you right now who teach online, you are, you are the most important thing in your class. And I truly hope that you know that. And I truly hope that you can, if you don't already feel empowered um, to bring your presence into your online class or to really understand what that means, I hope that what we talk about here today just starts to break that ice. Because we are at a point today where technology has become so um, available to us and so easy to use that we can create amazing content um, that can often really surprise faculty and look back and say, oh my gosh, I didn't think I could do that. And that's exactly one of the things that we strive to do in, um, that's exactly one of the things that we strive to do in the um, online teaching preparation program at CI is put faculty into a safe place and really push them out of their comfort zone and get them to create content, to record videos, to be real, okay? So um, we want to encourage faculty to be visible in their class, to be actively engaged and to be aware of and sensitive to student needs. And that's based on the work, uh, a study uh, by Savory, those components of instructor presence. The second ingredient is social presence. And social presence has a long developed um, um, history of literature in online teaching and learning. Um, it's also part of the community of inquiry model, which, uh, which is something that you may be familiar with. But what the research shows us is that if we can improve social presence in our class, student satisfaction goes up. The interaction between students goes up. And also the depth of learning increases. And I know that those are all things that we care about. And this is why social presence is so important. And I like to think about this topic of humanizing as the special sauce for student success online uh, for underserved student populations, but also for all students. So what is social presence? This is where it gets a little complicated. I think that many people have different um, definitions of social presence. So I collected some definitions here, which I'm not going to read through, but you can refer back to this. And I have full references for these um, citations at the end if you want to dig into any of the actual articles and studies. Um, for me, I think about, um, I, I, I tend to kind of think about it in a couple of ways. I think about it as uh, being real online, right? Um, being able to, to, to perceive that I'm online with real people and also sensing that I'm part of a community, sensing that I'm not just, you know, accessing content, but I'm part of a group. And those are the two components for me about social presence that are really critical. We've put together a, an infographic also um, that is available. It's shared with a Creative Commons license and it's kind of cool there in the Fit Studio where my colleagues are right now joining us um, at CI. They printed this out in a large poster size and it's, it hangs on the wall in the Fit Studio and it's kind of a, an important reminder for everyone, um, not just faculty, everyone about the values that we instill in online learning at CI. Um, I have a couple of contacts around the nation who have also printed this and hung it in their own um, faculty uh, support uh, environments. Um, so if this is something that you want to take, you can do that. The URL is at the bottom of the screen. And I also have it on the uh, resource site, the link that I shared with you earlier. So you can find it there beneath um, my slides at the bottom of the page. So one of the important components of that infographic and of online or humanizing online learning also is to really get past this idea that learning is just about the cognitive 
domain. I think in higher education, um, there's a real privileging of the cognitive domain of learning, right? The construction of knowledge. And obviously that's essential. But what we often forget about is the effective domain of learning. The domain that deals with emotions and feeling. And I, I really want each of you to just, you know, think back, close your eyes, think back through your own life and try to recall a powerful learning moment. And it doesn't have to be in a formalized environment. It could be, you know, anything that you recognize as a powerful learning experience. And I bet on some level you can recall emotions. Not only do emotions help us retain and remember, but they really are the factor that, um, that, that play an important role in moving from surface to deep learning, which is a really big part of humanizing. So this is a drill down into these two, um, um, I guess I should say spheres or categories um, that we consider when we think about humanizing online learning. It's really important to think about course design, um, choice, challenge, control, collaboration, constructing meaning, right? So active meaning and consequences and uh, the infographic drills in a bit more to those. Um, you know, since we, we only have a bit of time here together. I'm going to focus on the facilitation piece. Uh, and those, those three core principles within facilitation are presence, empathy, and awareness. So let's talk a little bit more about those principles. Um, presence is really all about being you, being real, being authentic online, um, and also being actively engaged. And I think that this becomes very, very clear. The importance of this becomes very, very clear when we ask ourselves a question like, how does it feel? Again, let's shift our lens. Let's shift our lens and look at this through a different lens. How does it feel to be a student in an online learning environment that doesn't have a strong presence from the instructor? I'm gonna play a really brief clip here from an online student. I can see that a professor isn't trying to interact with the course and I, it's just little things like the automatic announcements that only show up at 12 a.m. on a Sunday like you know it's all uh, automated they're just not there you leave a question and ask the professor and three weeks later you get a response like that's when I start to judge like I just wish you wouldn't be here like I wish you would focus your energy somewhere else because I'm not learning anything but yeah so that's the only so listening to that clip, you know, we get a sense of how that kind of um, complete automation, and I'm not saying automation isn't valuable. There's things that, that I automate in my online classes when I can, and that kind of automatic feedback can be really helpful to, for students. But when they're not backed by the sense of um, caring and empathy and awareness of students, who they are, treating them like real people, it can really become a problem. And as you can see, really impact um, satisfaction with learning and engagement. So of course we wanna strive not for that type of experience. We wanna strive for an experience where students feel safe, where they, they trust each other, uh, where they're invited to share. We've gotta carve out those opportunities as we design our courses for students to share their experiences, to make connections between the curriculum and their own experiences in real life, um, because that's really what starts to make their learning come alive. Now this concept of empathy is, is really fascinating to me. And um, at first glance, it might be something that seems simple, um, right? Empathy is uh, cognitive, effective empathy is thought of as, or can be defined as seeing a situation through the eyes of you know, the, the person. So stepping into a person's shoes. And that can, you know, sometimes folks think, gosh, you just can't do that online. But I completely think that it is possible. And not only is it possible, but it's very important. One of the things that I do in my online classes that I like to encourage other faculty to think about doing um, is to develop a very simple survey week one and ask students just very basic questions. You can ask them about, you know, anything. Have you taken an online class? Um, you know, whatever it is that you're concerned about. But one of the most powerful questions that, that I will include is, 
what in one word how are you feeling about this class right now in one word how are you feeling about this class and just i use google forms for this and by just glancing at that one column i immediately have a sense of the perceptions the attitudes that whole social dimension um, and how it's impacting my students experiences so the students who enter the class with and share a word like scared or anxious or nervous right then I can reach out to them directly and connect with them and make that connection and you know let them know I'm here for them and figure out what's going on on their end a little bit more so that's something that is easy to do those forms are easy to copy and you can create a general one and include it in all of your classes and it also leads to this next um, point of awareness empathy and awareness you know knowing their needs if we don't ask we're not going to know so we really need to be building in steps in our classes to make that happen a real brief research uh, touch on a research study I heard about recently about telling stories I'm a big storyteller I think stories are very important to engaging um, the effective domain of learning what I heard recently was about this thing, the study around something called neural coupling. And what it means, what the study has shown is that when a person tells a story, so as I tell a story, for example, certain parts of my brain start to fire. And when someone listens to that story, similar parts of their brains fire. And that is really fascinating to me because through telling a story that has some kind of emotional component, it's a way of evoking empathy within another person. And I think that can be very valuable for teaching in a class or online um, because we can tell stories very easily today in many different methods with the use of video and particularly using your own voice Telling stories with voice online is something that is so important. Students need to hear your voice. And you know what? I really believe that students need to hear each other's voices. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And the power of images in storytelling, of course, goes back to prehistory. So let's not forget that that's a critical part of being human. So a couple of practices, you know, how specifically, um, what else do we do? Um, one of the practices that we like to encourage faculty to think about is to do a redesign on their syllabus. And this can be a really great way to get started with humanizing because it's something that all faculty have, right, um, is a syllabus. And to start with that and to think about how you can change it uh, to be humanized can be really powerful. So if I take you out here to this... Um, this is a website. This is my syllabus. This is the actual website. So it's a link that students can go to. It's not locked down in an LMS. And um, what you'll see is it allows for me to embed videos. This is a welcome video here for my students that I created. <laughs> I'm Michelle Bukanski-Brock, and I'll be your instructor for the history of still photography. And it allows me to include all the other goodies that I need to have in my syllabus, um, as well as images and um, links to other goodies. It's interactive, uh, student readiness quizzes in here. There's another video of uh, blog awards, Master Piece blog awards, or a special peer-based award that I used to do in my online class. And of course, all the student resources as well. So rethinking the syllabus that can be something, um, you know, that really kind of embraces all these principles of humanizing that, um, that I'm referencing. That was made with a tool called popular.me. And um, in the chat box, I did share the link to that resource site. It's again, tiny.cc slash humanize dash more park. And at the bottom under resources, I have some information about how you can get started with your own um, popular syllabus. And this is one from one of our CI faculty, Jamie Hannons. And Jamie, Jamie's been great about embracing some of these principles of online learning. And I hear that um, Wendy is saying that she loves this idea. That's great. Um, 
and you know you can see that Jamie's implementing many of the same principles here but hi welcome to nursing 222 and she recorded that video there in the fit studio the faculty innovations and teaching studio at CI and then the other thing that we're doing at um, CI is building lots of resources for faculty who are willing to share we have a huge focus on sharing um, and so we're always reaching out to faculty who are implementing these practices and then sharing back what they're doing with other faculty. So this is um, a website that you can go to. I'm not going to go to it now just for the sake of time, but this is our digital syllabus gallery. And you can see that in the center, I have a link there for faculty to submit their own syllabus. Uh, this is something that we're just scratching the surface with, but it's where we are now with trying to cultivate this real sense of community around humanized and connected learning through technology and the value of sharing. The other thing that plays a really important role in humanizing learning at CI is our site-wide license to VoiceThread. VoiceThread is a web-based tool that is not um, innately offered within a learning management system, but it can have integration through LTI into ma any major learning management system. Um, I also understand that they just actually developed a formalized relationship with Blackboard. Um, but anyway. Uh, VoiceThread, what it, what it allows for us to do as, as instructors, as educators, is to really create experiences that are very different from any of the other tools that are traditionally included inside the, the, in an LMS. It allows for you as an instructor to bring in your voice, but also for students to bring in their voices in an asynchronous environment. And asynchronous is so important for particularly community college students because we know that many of them have full-time jobs, take care of families, and are doing their learning at all different hours of the day. That's one of the things I love the most about VoiceThread. And it allows for you to have conversations around media files that you upload. So this, for example, is um, a single slide in a voice thread that had many slides. Uh, it's, a sl it's a shot of a, a voice thread from one of my uh, history of photography classes. Um, the, the media in the middle is simply a presentation slide that I uploaded into the voice thread. And the small avatars that you see up and down the left side, those are, um, those are images of students who have left comments on that slide. So it's, it's very much a, you know, a discussion that occurs through voice, asynchronous voice or video using a webcam. And I'm gonna share um, a little bit about how some folks at CI are using um, VoiceThread. And I'm gonna click here and this will take us out to Stacy Anderson's VoiceThread. Um, Hi. This week, you're going to use VoiceThread to, to provide comments to your peers on paper number two. So please follow the instructions that come on the slides that follow. So Stacy's done a great job of modeling some of the important principles of including instructions and tips and how the grading will be handled, the norms for the conversation. Um, and then what she's done, it's really cool what she did here. She actually created a slide for every student in the class and then students were able to read the papers outside of um, Blackboard but come in and provide peer feedback on I think she assigned students um, assigned which students they'd provide peer feedback on so if I play this you'll hear the voices of a couple students um, I thought your essay was pretty good um, it's pretty relatable and you and I like how you went into detail the pros and cons of texting and how each per, each style of writing you did influenced you and how in which way it did. What I really liked about your essay was how you used, you explained your personal experience as well, um, writing in I'm not going to play the whole thing, but that way you at least get a sense of what a voice thread looks like. And these are all the slides in the voice thread. Um, and so that has been a really important part of humanizing learning at CI. And again, Stacey Anderson is, um, she teaches composition with us. Whoops. And I just went to the voice thread again. Hi. Sorry about that, folks. Let's try this. There we go. And Araceli Trujillo is one of our Spanish instructors, and she has just this semester completed 
teaching our fall semester completed teaching her very first fully online class and she has just dove in head first to this approach of humanizing. This is a still shot of one of our Sally's um, voice threads and she has gone into our fit studio in front of the live action recording um, green screen and recorded these very dynamic videos of herself demonstrating principles of, of the Spanish language and also Spanish um, culture in for her class and then she uploads the videos into the voice thread she also has different um, slides that are you know a little bit more granular and dealing with things like gran grammar um, and then the students have portions of the voice threads where they have to practice their language skills and also listen to each other and reply to each other. And I'd like to play this video here, which provided some feedback to our Sally. This is from one of her online students um, at the end of fall semester. Okay. Hola, profesora Trujillo. Um, it's Rachel. I just wanted to leave a voice, um, well, I guess, a. Uh, a video comment um, just saying that I thought that your videos were very helpful uh, especially when you did quick review and stuff like that because sometimes the material was kind of hard to learn just by just by law. I thought it was a lot helpful when you would go back and kind of use examples so that was really good um, and I think voice thread in general was a good way to kind of run this class because I can't really think of any other way that you could do this. So voice thread is 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 a good thing. Um, as for like listening to the classmates and whatnot, so like when you made us go back and listen to people, that really helped, um, especially me, because that forced me to like actually listen to others. I mean, it's probably a lot easier to listen to my classmates because they're about the same level as me, but it still kind of forced you to be like, oh, okay, um, that's, that's this word or that's that because um, for me listening is probably the hardest part for me, especially when we do the, the homework that's really hard but but yeah so I thought that was really good but overall I thought everything was awesome and I really liked your videos they're really enjoyable and overall good job I really I really enjoyed this class and I was kind of hoping that you could do a Spanish two online but I saw that that wasn't offered yet, so maybe sometime in the future. But yeah, so good job and thanks for everything. <laughs> Isn't that the coolest? <laughs> I just love that. I think it's fabulous. Um, and you can see, you know, that relationship is is really coming through there with the, the voice and video communications. Now, I'm, I want to dig in a little bit to how this is impacting the student um, students on actual, you know, what the student experience is like when they learn out loud. And the slides I'm about to show you are based on my own research that I did while teaching um, at a California community college, okay? Um, this is a quote from a student, learning out loud helps us get to know each other. It makes us more sensitive to one another's opinions and thoughts. We're more likely to be respectful to one another. So you can see that real um, shifting of things. It's starting to bring, uh, really diminish some of the anonymity that can take take a part in an online class, which is part of building community, you know, and that social presence being real. 86% um, of the students that I surveyed um, agreed that it makes them feel connected to their peers. I love this quote here, by the way. It's one of my favorites ever. I feel like we got to know each other. I actually recognized a classmate at my chi children's Taekwondo class because of the sound of her voice. So making those jumps from, you know, the this concept of disconnected learning online to, I mean, hearing a peer's voice and saying, hey, are you in my online class? I, I just, I took that as a real success. I was very excited about that. And 95% of students I surveyed either agreed or strongly agreed that listening to peers increases their ability to reach the learning objectives. When we think about learning, um, the learning is, is variable. Uh, learner variability is something that we really need to, to embrace and think about as we design our online classes that goes back to supporting the principles of universal design for learning or UDL um, and VoiceThread is absolutely wonderful for that. 
Uh, students also are recognizing, 83% uh, of them strongly agreed or agreed that when they spoke, they remembered the information better. And again, it's not about having them speak everything, but it's about adding that, designing that variety into the learning environment so that more needs of more diverse students are being supported cognitively as well as socially. Um, oh, this is just another quote on the same point. And when I asked about drawbacks, these were the themes that came out. Um, the students said none really other than me tripping over my tongue and having to re-record a lot. A lot of students mentioned that, you know, but we know as educators that, okay, that might be a nuisance, but when it comes to learning, that's a good thing, that repetition. Um, but all students you know, generally do agree that it gets better uh, as they get more comfortable with it. And then I do have some students who indicated that um, working around a noisy family environment can be a barrier. Um, and so that, and, and also getting a microphone. By the way, VoiceThread has the ability to comment using a, any telephone. And I don't mean an app, I don't mean a smartphone, any telephone. So if you have students, if you are using VoiceThread and you have students who don't have a microphone or, or can't use the, the mobile app on a smartphone, um, they can actually just enter their telephone number, their phone will ring and they can record into that. So. Moral of the story, everyone, is I just want to end on one note. When you teach online, you can perceive that there's a locked door between you and your students. Or you can design a class and facilitate it in a way that unlocks that door and opens to an immense, immensely valuable and rewarding experience for you as an instructor and for your students. And I really do believe that online classes can be life-changing for students. They are life-changing for students. They can be just as inspirational, if not more, because some of their um, more specific learning needs can be met through careful um, design of these courses and facilitation. So, um, that is essentially the end of my presentation. I would love to take some questions, if there are any, from those um, there in Moore Park or anyone online. Um, I did have one question from Amy that came through on Twitter, I noticed. Um, and I do want to address that first while the rest of you are thinking about your questions. Uh, Amy, you asked if uh, CI's online teaching preparation program is just for CI or if um, faculty outside of CI can enroll. That's a question that we get a lot. We have a lot of inquiries from faculty around the nation who wanna take the classes. Um, and we're working to try to find additional resources to support that demand. At this point in time, this semester, for the very first time, we are reserving some seats in the humanizing class uh, for faculty outside of CI. Um, so if you click on the link that I did include on the resource page to the online teaching preparation program, you can learn more about the courses. And again, it is the humanizing one that we are um, going to be allowing some non-CI faculty to take. So you can reach out to me directly if you are interested in that. And I will just um, let you go ahead and ask questions. If there's anyone online who wants to unmute themselves and ask a question too, that's absolutely fine. I would love that. Michelle, we have a question in the room and I wanted to ask you first whether or not there's a cost if you were to allow someone from outside CI to take that humanizing class. Um, not, not currently. We are, um, this semester we are, we, like I said, have some seats reserved and we are not charging for that. Good to know. Okay, and we had a question in the room. This is Doug Thiel who teaches psych, I think. Well, no, I teach philosophy. Philosophy, I'm, I was I'm, close. I'm teaching an online course at uh, Oxnard. It's been going on for quite a while. I'm try to implement some of the things that you brought up today. And I, I think this thing about the uh, syllabus was fantastic. I'm okay. going to be doing that. But uh, in terms of data, uh, one of the things nationwide with these online courses is that we seem to have a greater attrition, no matter kind of what we do sometimes, and you do it an online, an on-ground course where you can make those humanizing connections because you're face-to-face. -face. So what I'm asking you is, do you have any data to support that the strategies that you are using has a, 
has had a positive impact on the uh, attrition rates in online courses. So what the literature shows around that is they're not looking specifically at attrition, but they're looking at, go back to the, the, the research um, literature that I've shared in the presentation about social presence. Um, and so student satisfaction going up, you know, it's funny because this, this concept of it, it's, it's, I think it's very much, I don't know if everyone will agree with me, but the more national I've been engaged with online learning, um, it's very a much a California conversation as this idea of the, the success rates. Um, so I think that where the focus of the literature has been is in um, social presence and how that impacts student satisfaction, interaction, and uh, learning in an online class. What I would really like to see, and I know that my colleagues at CI agree with me, um, and that's the direction we're headed in, is we'd like to really be focusing on doing some studies that look at how um, or in what ways um, these practices are impacting the student experience. And I think that um, you know, success in a course is one of those factors we should consider. And Michelle, I'd just like to add, Doug Hirsch at Santa Barbara City College, who's a dean there, did a study in, I think it was 2012, um, that showed his online success rate increased when he did instructor um, videos on lectures and also on question and answer in his classroom. Yeah, thank you for reminding me about that study. I actually have that um, included in my in my book, Best Practices for Teaching with Emerging Technologies. He calls he refers to it as the human presence design model, I believe. Uh, yeah, and so that that process really integrates the use of um, brief faculty introduction videos for modules. And as you said, it that study, you're right, it did actually look at success in an online class and compared it to a class environment that was designed without the videos in that. Um, did show a difference. So thanks for reminding me of that, Joanna. Are you defining success as increased, you know, better grades? Or are you defining it as staying with the course, leading that? What, what's your definition of success? Well, that's a great question. When I just used the term success, I was applying it as we do in the California Community College system, which is ending the class with an A, B, or a C grade. And that's, that the way, that's the way Hirsch defined it also. Other questions here? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I have a question. I'm Tony Isaacs. I teach in the Child Development Department. And I really love the idea of a voice thread. Does that have an option for closed captioning for hearing impaired students? Did you hear the question, Michelle? Yes. Um, hang on one second. I'm just typing it. I just realized that Ray Kopp is here with oh, us, great. the researcher who did this, the study that I started out with. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so Ray, hold on one second. I'd love to have you chime in on what we're talking about. Um, so VoiceThread has made amazing strides with accessibility, and just this past year, they have um, offered an integration. So um, for those who purchase a, a, a license to VoiceThread, a site license to VoiceThread, um, you can have any video or voice comment closed captioned by partnering with a third party vendor. And I think the ones they use are three play media and Amara. And so it's, it's built into the voice thread interface. It's just, it's a third party that you also have an account with, but yes, that's, that's brand new for a while. Now they've had the ability to caption videos that you upload. So like central media videos. So the videos that are Sally Trujillo is uh, recording in the studio and uploading into the voice thread those are captions they do appear with captions yes and I'll show you a, a free captioning service that we have available to us um, after we're done with this session um, so that that's a great question about whether or not uh, voice thread is accessible we're also going to show you how to get a, a sample a free site um, a free sample to voice thread and uh, Lisa Putnam our Dean is looking into whether or not we can get a site license it's kind of expensive but but she's looking into that for us and gave us a big encouraging maybe so <laughs> but we can definitely start with the trial and I would just add on the point of accessibility um, voice thread is flash based and I know that this is you know with accessibility we often think about just captions but what they've done so flash based what that means is it's not accessible to screen readers however there is a it's like a back door to voice thread and it opens all these same content and features of a voice thread but in a fully HTML version um, environment. So that is accessible by screen readers. And that, that's just kind of, it's, it's automatically available. Um, it's, it's not fully 
logical that it's there, um, but it is something that students have direct access to. They can actually go into their control panel and change the default to Voice Start Universal so that it always opens in HTML if that's something they need access to. So um, I would love to hear from, have a hello from Ray and, and see what, what he wants to, to share. We're so happy that you're here, Ray. Do you have a microphone? Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, you do. You sound great. Hi, I see you. Hey. Uh, so th I, this is just fabulous. I love the connection between research and practice. Um, and, and the piece I wanted to chime in on actually was on the success rates. I, this semester I did a couple of online uh, uh, class, um, you know, peer, peer evaluations for, uh, uh, for colleagues. Uh, and they were, you know, they were classes where they took the McGraw-Hill curriculum and plugged it into a LMS and put it on autopilot and, uh, and they had the sort of the 60% attrition rate that you see uh, over half the students bailed uh, by the time I did the evaluation uh, of the class. And these are folks who are responding to emails and doing a fairly decent job of executing on publisher curriculum. Uh, and, and I taught a class this last semester in business communications. I started with 30 students. I didn't do as good of a job as you've done with yours of the sort of the humanizing things, but I do, you know, put up a video of me talking and I'm, uh, the thing I do is I'm, I'm incredibly responsive. If somebody texts me, I text them right back. And if they, I'm on email all the time. So, so I, I try and, take uh, take as much of the asynchronous delay out of it as I can. Um, um, and I started with 30 students and I ended with 24 with a C or better in the class. I had a couple that failed the class for, you know, life got in the way kind of issues and I had a couple that dropped. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed with those results. I think that's, you know, having, what is that? Uh, 80 percent, um, you know, make it to the end with a passing grade, uh, I think is uh, a pretty unusual number uh, for an online class. No, normally, we see something 50 to 60 percent in our online classes overall. So I just wanted to throw that out. And Ray, did you also say um, that you meet with your students on site? I think we may have spoken on the phone. Yeah, you know, we, we do an, I do a mandatory orientation. Uh, well, I say it's a mandatory orientation, and I pull them ahead of time on their availability. Uh, this time I held two separate orientations to accommodate people's schedules. Uh, there was one person who couldn't make either one of them, and I made them do a, a join me orientation where I did a, uh, a little join me video conference session with them. Uh, so I meet every student face to face, even if it's online. Uh, before the class starts and and then uh, and then we do a wrap-up we did a wrap-up at the end of the class uh, that was a face-to-face -face event and one of their assignments it's a business of communications class so one of their assignments was to plan and execute that event um, using the skills of business communication that they're learning through the semester so uh, so, so I bookend the online class with these uh, with a face-to-face -face session on either end. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, the, the orientation is definitely one of those best practices um, and probably something that I should be referencing as we go through these, these components. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. And it's, it's so great to have you here. And thank you for your fabulous research. I know that you know that I'm a big fan. So <laughs> thank you, Ray. And I can make that available to anybody in the room too, because I have that, uh, that link also. And I wanted to acknowledge um, a question or a comment question here from Ishita Edwards. He's who an is econ a, teacher at Oxford. Thank you very much. You. Welcome. And the comment slash question is one of the restrictions I have experienced regarding instructor video lectures and possibly even voice threads is resources. Can the district purchase licenses for the entire district, all three colleges at a lower rate? Do you want to take that, Joanna? Or, well, I mean, I, I can speak to it, but I think that may have been meant for you. Um, we, right now, we have not done that at the district level, but our district is working more um, collaboratively among all three campuses. In fact, we have these uh, 
Gwyn is calling them at, at Oxnard is calling them summit meetings. I don't know if we can really go there, but um, anyway, so we are meeting um, monthly among all the colleges to kind of work this kind of stuff out so that we do have more collaboration since there's, you know, greater uh, power in numbers. But we here at um, Moore Park College right now are just barely working on those site licenses. Ventura College, as you know, is a pilot college for the Canvas um, conversion, so they're a little bit ahead of us on that. And we're not 100% sure where Oxnard is on that, at least I'm not. But um, Ashita, all I can tell you is we're working more and more at the district level to see if we can um, consolidate our resources. And Michelle, if you know more about um, uh, license rates, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I'm not involved with license rates. Um, you know, it's something that VoiceThread obviously handles um, directly. But I, I just would also say to really be thinking about statewide consortium pricing. Um, there has been, you know, wonderful precedents set through the use of live video conferencing in the CCC system for years. Um, every community college in California has had access to um, CCC Confer, which is, you know, a white label of um, Blackboard Collaborate. And I didn't even know that the Zoom is now available. So this is brand new. And, you know, technology has changed dramatically, right? As you're noting, Ishida. Um, and so the needs of faculty teaching have changed dramatically. So, um, you know, that I think that it's really a valuable thing. It's important important thing to really be to to be speaking um, you know at the at the site-wide level to be connecting across the state and saying hey we need this we need this and um, it's something I would really encourage everybody to do because consortium pricing is going to be much more affordable than even a district price that's a really good idea any other questions for Michelle any questions online Oh, here's a question. Go ahead, Laura. For someone who is just starting out, what three things would she recommend starting out with? Did you hear the question, Michelle? I did, yeah. I would really encourage you to start with your syllabus. Like I said, I think that that's kind of a um, low barrier starting point. It's something that faculty feel is very doable, um, you know, and start with designing it in popular. I think that if you did that, you'll be amazed at how that starts to make you think about other ways you can incorporate the same tool. Um, something you can do with popular is actually clone sites. Um, and I'd be willing, I'd be happy to email you a clone link of my own syllabus, which means if you create your free popular educator account, you can open mine and just edit it for your own needs. Totally happy to do that. Um, in addition to that, I would encourage you to try to get comfortable with video. And I know that that maybe that counts as number two and three on that list because I know that faculty can often be, you know, pretty nervous about recording in front of video. Um, you know, just try to start doing it. Um, get familiar with YouTube. It's free. You can share your videos there as unlisted or public. So if you put your videos up as unlisted, what that means is only those who have the link will see them. So if they're just embedded in your online course, that's the only way they're going to be found. And I guess the third thing, um, popular, I would, again, I'm not saying create a video right off the bat, maybe just get familiar with it, start to figure out what you could use and how to do it. Um, and what was the third thing? Um, you said it also pertained to video. Yes. Oh, embedding. I said embed. Well, I can't believe how many faculty who have taught online for so many years don't even know what embedding is. And I think that that in and of itself can change the game completely for faculty when you realize that when you're creating content and a tool outside like YouTube, like VoiceThread, um, like SlideShare, if you put a presentation up in SlideShare, which is what I did on the resource page I provided for you, it comes with embed code. It's HTML code that you can embed in your learning management system and then the content appears there. And I see Araceli shaking her head. <laughs> you probably remember the first time you learned how to embed something. It's kind of one of those moments where you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know I could do this. So ask your support folks about that and understand that process and then you'll be starting out in a really good place. And Michelle, on the popular um, syllabus, I asked you about that last a few days ago, and you mentioned that you had had a, a screen reader and a disability expert go through it and gave you results that it was indeed um, accessible. 
Yes, and our disability expert is sitting in the FIT oh, studio awesome. right now. <laughs> Christy, do you want to speak to that a little bit, Christy? I'm going to put you on the spot. I, I just mentioned to Joanna that you, what you discovered through, um, through the accessibility testing with Popular and, and a strategy that you might have for improving the accessibility of a Popular page. Um, okay, so for Popular, I've learned that when you're adding in images and videos, it goes off of the name that it's saved as. So instead of having an image of, say, Michelle saved as DSC underscore random numbers and characters, instead rename that, you know, Michelle Pekansky photo or image of Michelle Pekansky Brock, something like that. Because when I ran VoiceOver, which is the free screen reader on uh, Max, it says that name. And while you can't, well, it does say like .jpg, which normally you wouldn't do in alternate text it still gives you more understanding and context of what that image is versus not being able to see anything and hearing DSC 06425. And I'd have no idea that that was Michelle's image. Um, the color contrast is another big thing. Um, there's a free tool called Color Contrast Analyzer and it's C-O-L-O-U-R, an analyzer with an S instead of a Z. It's from the Paseo group. Um, it's a, and it's available on Mac and PC side. And you're able to select your background color and your foreground, your foreground and your background color, and it tests it for AA and AAA compliance. And it's really simple. It has a little um, magnifying glass. You select one color, select the other color, and then you'll either get checks or red X's. Um, that's a really easy way to make sure because contrast is a huge. Um, it's very important to make sure that you know if you have dark text, you want to have it on a lighter screen versus saying if I had red screen and yellow text that would be absolutely atrocious does that help yeah thanks christy yeah so you know as as i quickly learned with popular um there was there's no alt text field for the images which is what christy just explained so that that the what she discovered was saving the the image files as alt text your inner your file name is one way to improve that but the actual headings in the popular pages actually um work work pretty well with the screen reader so they're like style headings, heading one, heading two. Oh, nice. Yeah, and you'll see that when you start building pages that they're different sizes and they're just they're headings that are built. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Any other questions for Michelle or an accessibility expert? That's so wonderful you're here. In Desire to Learn, just so you know, and of course we're transferring to Canvas eventually, but for now, we do have an accessibility tester when it comes to color. Because most of the time, please correct me if I'm wrong, with um, accessibility, we can't really use color for emphasis because screen readers can't see it. But in um, Desire to Learn, it will tell you whether or not it meets the criteria for um, contrast. That sound right? Okay. Great. Well, I know you all have more to do, and you're going to jump in with some hands-on stuff. So um, should we wrap it up? We're ready if you are. Anybody else online? Well, thank you to everyone who joined us online. Thank you to everyone in the room. And most of all, uh, and thank you to our guest, Ray, who came. I'm not sure if he's still there. He did um, have to go. A researcher and, and also our accessibility experts at CI. And most of all to you, Michelle, thank you so much for your uh, spending your morning with us. This was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. And I'll send you the link for the recording. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sheeta. Bye, everyone. Now, Joanna, you're good without me for this next portion, right? I think so. We are. Okay. We have um, a technologist here, so I think we're good. Thank you okay. so much, Michelle. Okay. If you have any follow-up questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Okay. Excellent. Okay. I will Bye. be in touch. Bye. Thank you.